And our next speaker is Dimitri de Jonge, a microelectronic engineer with a broad view on how society is developing and how we should eventually be able to build autonomous systems and infrastructure for almost everything. Right, Dimitri? Everything. So please tell us more. Thank you. Um, Michael, Michael took the clicker. Come back. Thanks. Steve. <laughs> All right, that was easy. Let's kick it up a notch. Hey, hi everyone. Um, just take a look upstairs. This is amazing woodwork. Um, also, uh, I noticed we're in the city of MC Escher, which is probably one of my favorite artists. And I, what I like a lot about him is that he gives a vision of continuity and also duality. And that's something that I want to include in our talk a bit because we do morph and transform, and we have a multitude of visions and perspectives. And I especially want to talk about commonization, how to build out public infrastructure that's sustainable, that's worth existing, and I will remain. But mainly, I will go Kanye West style on you, and I will talk about myself. <laughs> so, yeah, this is me. And in my head, there is a few dualities. At one side, I have my instant gratification monkey, which obviously could catch my banana. And we have a rational decision maker, somebody that tries to think about the hive mind, that tries to think about the future. We have different goals, but this is me at work, just clicking buttons, making money. And I want to talk about this infrastructure. I want to see how it evolves from common infrastructure to private infrastructure. And then we went into giving it more to the government for some public utilities. And now we're talking about decentralized infrastructure and even somewhat autonomous infrastructure. And that's going to be very interesting to talk about. But first of all, we have to talk about our shared problems because that's the reason why we have all this infrastructure. My instant gratification monkey has other problems than my rational decision maker. One just wants to have short-term food. The other one is thinking about, well, what if meteorites strike the Earth again? Or what if um, we deplete all our resources? So these two things have to remain in balance. And we cannot just ignore that we have both of them in our brains. We have a primary brain and a secondary brain. It's just how we are. If you look at, let's say, up till the 1700s, we had a lot of common pasture because we had a lot of shared problems. We need to have food, shelter, irrigation, um, even defense. So a lot of the land was in the commons. And there's this amazing person called Eleanor Ostrom who has achieved the Nobel Prize for Economics as the first woman and the only woman so far. And she discovered that there are actually still commons in our current state of the world. There is an irrigation project in Spain. There are uh, meadows in even Switzerland and Great Britain. And there is communities in, in, in Japan that actually share that common resource. It's super important to, to think about how do they manage to share this resource without depleting it? How can that instant gratification monkey not just take it all for himself and run away? How can that common understanding of the state of that resource may remain intact? So there is also something called Ostrom's Law. She didn't invent it. So actually, somebody else reflected on her life and her work and said that, a resource arrangement that works in practice, because that's what she found, that there are actually working in practice, can also work in theory. And I like the commons. I live somewhat in the commons. I live off the commons. I l use a lot of internet for my work. I use code, open source. Maybe that's our digital commons. That's very valuable to me, because what 
we share is knowledge, code, review, feedback systems, discussion fora. Without any monetary benefit, it's more like, hey, somebody was wrong on the internet. I'm going to point it out. Or, oh, I got my GitHub stars. Somebody's actually using my stuff. A little instant gratification that makes me happy every night. And of course, that's not a reason why I really do it. If I really think about it clearly, we do want to create a shared intelligence structure or a knowledge graph or an infrastructure for the world. But mainly, we have to make sure that if we're looking at this shared infrastructure, it can only exist if you have fair value capture. If you can measure the amount of value created at each portion of that contribution of resources in that shared layer, then we can start redistributing value in a way more efficient way. And we can give a reason for this public infrastructure to exist and to thrive and to become resilient and anti-fragile. Think about sharing your media, your digital arts, because many of these things, they start in an artistical movement. And Creative Commons is very successful. And they have something called CC0, which means public waiver. They also have things where you want to just to have your attribution, like share alike. And what people do here is they start to think, well, I can freely use all this art, but I need to attribute people. I need to just make sure that the creator of this artwork is at least recognized. Now, here's a problem. The internet is not made for attribution. The internet just links forward, never backward. Things spread virally. It's almost impossible to retrace where it came from. There was a project called Xanadu from Ted Nelson that didn't really make the race of the internet because it was way too complex, but it has this bi-directional linkage in mind. The thing that Tim Berners-Lee put down is more usable. It's just more easy to use. That's why it's so viral. But when I think of things like blockchain and shared state, I often compare it to maybe what carbon dating did for our mapping our history. It gives us a forensic tool to know in the digital space what happened before what. And now we don't have that yet. But if we can actually point out events and say, this person did this thing at this point in time, it becomes very interesting. So we explored this a bit. And our first gig we did five years ago about was called Ascribe. And the question we had was, can you truly own digital? Can you create digital scarcity in terms of creators? So we were looking at the Bitcoin blockchain, and there was an obvious example of scarcity, because there's only so many Bitcoins to spend, to, to basically mint. And if you look at digital, then Scarcity is in the medium. It's not in the rights. Scarcity is because there are so many CDs. There are so many subscriptions to Spotify. But the problem is, of course, CD goes bust, LPs goes bust, and you lose all the rights to this digital content. You don't have a true connection between the artist, the creator, and the fan base. So if we can find a shared infrastructure, in order to get that attribution in place and say that, well, we have this shared database, nobody owns and controls it, it's just there, it's kind of immutable, let's just put licenses on that. So I started spamming the Bitcoin blockchain, and I'm quite proud to say that if you look at the most used Bitcoin wallets, you have a few exchanges, and then I think I'm around, or at least Ascribe uh, is around place 10 or 15. So 100,000 microtransactions. Uh, it made the Bitcoin network congest for a while, and it was a lot of fun. So, but the cool thing was that a creator could upload his artwork, create a hash, put that hash as a proof of ownership, and then start creating limited editions for licensing out of that, like Bitcoin transactions, exactly the same. So 
that was the first experiment with attribution, and we think that was very important for us to understand what is value capture. Now, let's move forward a bit. Industrial revolution kicks in after the commons. And all that land is a little bit underutilized. So we have to find a way, an incentive for people to optimize land production. So let's get rid of those commons. And let's put the enclosure acts in place and privatize all that property and put that property in a competitive market for farming. Interesting, because now every farmer has a competition against others, and he can get more resources from overutilizing his land, maybe overproducing his land. Now, that's interesting, because this privatization, putting public infrastructure, or maybe not owned infrastructure, onto the market leads to a few tricky things, maybe the wrong incentives. Think about everything that's currently privately owned, but actually publicly used. Mobility. And we have Uber trying to control all mobility of the world uh, and setting the prices, taking big cuts of, of all mobility aspects. Facebook trying to become our identity provider to an extent that you, if you try to do hashtag delete Facebook, but remember that you also logged in in all those peripheral services with Facebook, so you kind of lose that access as well, and that was kind of messy. And then there is maybe some... I, I, I'm actually going to try to get an analogy of how Facebook works in a few slides, so let's not go there. Uh, Comcast, which has some ties with maybe interesting governmental sites. Google is not your search company, it's a tracking company. It tracks your behavior across the internet, uh, across three million advertisement sites, and then creates something like a surveillance economy where they can steer your monkey behavior towards, oh, easy click, you can have it now. Amazon Prime, you can have it tomorrow delivered from the other side of the world to now. It's easy, it's low cost, zero margin almost. It's, I use it. But, Let's put our rational decision maker at work. I want you all to take a moment of silence and zen. Close your eyes, maybe, if that helps. And just think about the first time you opened a web browser, maybe in the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s, the first queries you did. Alta Vista, Hotbot, Ask Chiefs, GeoCities, MySpace, ICQ, IRC all that stuff up to Facebook and what we have now. Can you imagine maybe you even went to gambling sites or adult sites? Oh my God. Oh, you know what? That's still out there. Your entire digital history, all your breadcrumbs, they're on somebody else's server. You don't own and control that. Well, here I'm showing the Wayback Machine, showing like how uh, the Internet Archive with all best intentions tries to take a backup of the entire internet, and I think that's very useful. But it's not only the Internet Archive doing that. <laughs> There's also other companies that just map out your digital twin across its entire lifespan, and that will only become more and more and more. I think I wouldn't be surprised that in 20 years we're close to 90% of digitizations of our actions and our behavior. It's going to be important to be self-sovereign of that. So, your personal data is on, buddies, on somebody else's servers, typically, and they maximize for data ownership. Because the more data I get, the better models you can do, the better you can steer behavior. And of course, then, things happen. Your data is worth a lot. A lot of data is worth more. AI on top of that is very interesting. Yeah, take it. <laughs> um, there is a lot of interesting things going on with internet neutrality. Of course, we know what's the, what would be the data breach of the week. Huh? We don't care anymore. We just know that it's happening. And then maybe it happens to be mapping out 
your entire daily behavior through surveillance in more like a police state, where you have social credit systems, and people know exactly where you walk, what you do, and what you cannot do. So, this is probably very inaccurate, but let's try it. Here is me and my instant gratification monkey being best friends. And suddenly we got this amazing app called Facebook, and we can control our access to that app, and, and it allows us to create a digital me, a dimi. And this digital me is not on my server, it's on somebody else's server. And they decide, Maybe you want to meet this person, or this person, or this service, or this product, or you want to see this advertisement. Very interesting. You know what? I'm not controlling that behavior. But I like it. My instant gratification get, monkey gets a lot of additional little benefits, so I keep interacting with the product. I think that's a, not the right model to, to employ. You could say that capitalism has crashed. There is an actually a mistake in the slide, but I didn't make it. Um, so I think capitalism is a little bit dying out. I think Jeff Bezos is probably one of the last monopolists. Um, and we have to not augment capitalism with other structures. We have to give us a, an opportunity to put something alternative in place. And I think that's when we talk about commonization, shared infrastructure, and at least a lot of value capture, fair value capture. So we have a few driving forces. Uh, we saw this decentralization aspect, which is all about distributing power, making more equitable outcomes possible. Self sovereignty, own what belongs to you. Align incentives, because we have that monkey in our brain. And cryptography which makes all these integrity features possible from a point of view that you say that the resources of an attacker has to be bigger than the benefits he can extract from the system, because it's not absolute cryptography. And I think if you combine all these things, you, you, you're looking at what I personally believe might be one of the most biggest superpowers of the blockchain. It's an incentive machine. It has this heartbeat, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example. Every 10 minutes, it throws out new Bitcoins. And it gives them to people that help secure the network, that contribute resources to this network, like hashing power, putting up servers, creating hardware, FPGAs, dedicated chips called ASICs, operating them. People are doing stuff in the real world to get this virtual reward because there is scarcity. And it optimizes towards one goal, security of the network. That's the optimization of Bitcoin. What happens is that you now create so much hashing power in the network, then you're probably close to 10,000 times the amount of computing power that the top 500 supercomputers have. That's a lot. Maybe too much. Maybe Bitcoin has gone wrong. Think about the paperclip optimizer. <laughs> eh? If you create a smart paperclip like Clippy, he's been listening to our Excel for a while now. And we've asked a lot of questions to Clippy, and Clippy knows. He learns. And Clippy only wants to see more Clippy. So the first thing Clippy does is create better intelligence, super intelligence, be to humans, so I can get more resources to create more Clippies. Once I got all resources of humans, and humans actually die out because they have no more resources, but it all went into Clippy, I'm going to take those rockets, fly off to all these other planets with a lot of metal to create more Clippies. That happens if you have a single objective function. But we can have a more complex network. And that's where we talk about communities. I think communities are stronger than economies, because communities have a mission, a vision, they have values, they have funds, they have problems, and they have solutions, and they have discussion for, and they have ethics. They have so much more than just a blunt economy. An economy is a big part of it, it steers our incentives, and it shares resources, but it's not the end state. The end state is healthy, sustainable communities 
and sustainable resources. And if you have those communities that are decentralized and they start pooling all their resources, they can create something super powerful, maybe more powerful than, than Google. If you start collaborating on data sharing, for example, or intelligence, or maybe in supply chains, decentralized supply chains that might be competitive towards Amazon. That might be a goal. And we want to create shared infrastructure, a public utility network. But think beyond shelter, food, water. Think about everything we're also going to need in the digital age, bandwidth, knowledge, privacy, uh, proof of unique human, uh, everything related to, to protocol and empathy, maybe you can put that into, into a layer. Uh, think about an empathic protocol. How would that look like? I think that would know what are the resources that other agents in the system need and require to thrive, and it would respect that space. and wouldn't try to get more resources for itself. So we're creating this public utility network in a shared protocol. We're even reinventing the wheel. Self-driving cars. This is a project we did um, maybe one year ago as a concept, together with a few car makers that want to make autonomous driving really a reality, and realizing that they can't capture all the data, and especially not if they only have data from sunny California or Arizona, where was it? But they need to have a plurality of perspectives on that data. They need to have data from Mumbai. Uh, they need to have data from maybe blizzards in Canada or um, anything you can capture with your dash cams. It's all useful. It can create even city data. There's so much things you can eat in order to make these autonomous cars actually a reality. Hence, we have to start pooling resources. There's no single aggregator that can provide this to us. But also healthcare. If we create a health data fund. You can donate your organs, maybe, but maybe when you die, you say, well, I'm also going to donate my data for, for research. And you can create a health database that creates maybe an intelligence layer that's <laughs> privacy-preserving, using advanced techniques like privacy-preserving machine learning, but can create a model for human health. And then you download that model, and you fork it towards your personal characteristics, and then you have your health coach that you own and control. I'm going to see how we can actually build this, and because that's what we're here for. So I'm thinking, well, let's start with, at the bottom, having this shared resource layer, these physical entities. I'm, I'm putting server farms here, but that could be basically anything that uh, maybe it's energy, maybe it's mobility, maybe something else, maybe it's forests. And then we have to measure stuff. Who contributed what to the system? That's why we use this thing called tokens and transactions on a ledger. This is our, our blockchain. This is our carbon dating method. To know who is contributing what at which point in time and what's the value of that. Tokens are interesting. The main thing you have to remember about the token is in a shared infrastructure system, it measures the value contributed, and it gives you that amount of equity in the network. Because currently, in private, equity and work are separated things. You have your investors and your workers. The token smashes it into one thing. If you contribute to the network, you become a stakeholder in the network. Very important. And then there are other actors in the systems, like equity providers, that make these more liquid markets. We do a lot about token engineering. And token engineering is just trying to get some practice and some methodologies and share a lot of knowledge, because these systems have to be designed very, very carefully, because they might have big impacts, and they have to have governance. So what I'm working mostly around is work tokens. That's kind of my thing. Uh, proof of service, this prove that you did a computation, prove that you delivered data, prove that you trained a machine learning model. Cryptographically prove that, and then you get that attributed in token. Access control, like the Grex hive mind. How can I access devices, their sensors and actuators, their data? What's also really interesting, and that's what humans are very good at, is making connections, creating a mental graph of knowledge 
that says that A and B have this relationship between each other. Humans are really good at it. And we could call it curation. Or you could even say that if you promote something that you believe that will be important in the future, like you do on Twitter, for example, then you're signaling. What if we can make that attention economy a bit more scarce so that it doesn't overflood us? And we can set our own filters. There's also governance. There's a lot of interesting token models. And it's worth looking at some of them. But what's really important is that we drive away from where the applications on top take all the value and they forget about the infrastructure. We have to make sure that we create fat protocols that capture a big portion of that value. And that's where we need this measurement for. And how do we do that? Incentives. If you build in incentives on top of that token layer, you might find a way for people to actually have resource benefits or any type of benefit, mental, social, from working and contributing to a system. And that's where you play with your instant gratification monkey. Incentives are by far one of the most important things to think about when thinking about economics, societies, and communities. Why are people doing this? And I think the blockchain space and decentralization space really needs more incentives. Because what I see is that those core layers are getting a bit neglected, and everybody's working on those fancy applications on top of them. But they still need a lot of love and care on that infrastructure, because how can you create a cool application if you're limited by the lower level protocols? There's a lot of games you can play. Uh, but humans typically take a zero-sum game. Anyways, our instant gratification monkey kind of loves playing games. And that's how you try to engage people into a system and have a high retention rate and show that there's benefits. And those benefits don't have to be personal. They can also go into the commons. Or you can steer towards the commons. This is what we did with Ocean Protocol. We have a mission saying that, well, data is siloed, humans are farms, AI monopolies, and, and tech giants, giants they, they leave no room for other actors in the system, and they control our behavior. It's all kind of messed up. We need to democratize access to AI and data. I'm over time. All right. Um, anyways, what we're going to do, we try to reward and measure what's relevant data and AI services in the system. And we're going to give a bonus, minting new tokens, if people contributed to the commons. And we also want to go one step further. We want to make sure that not only on the resource layer there is decentralization, but also from the governance layer on top of it, who controls the future of the projects. And then we're thinking about, well, what if that's fully automated? What if artificial intelligence takes over there? Can we create good computer virus that run on this unstoppable substrate, create new type of economical agents with maybe legal impact that are non-human? And that's kind of a very interesting point in, in time we are now. We can actually build that. In Malta, you can make DAOs that are regulated and they can sue people. So this means that we now can create Instances that are non-human, have no human guardian, and they can control stuff. Resources, they can sue people into the legal, maybe in the future. So we have to be careful how we design this. Especially if you go to my table later and, and try to see about AI DAOs or self-owned artificial intelligence. And we, many of these things that we're going to discuss is about well, what's cool to do and what's ethical to do. And find the cross-section there or at least maybe something very unethical to do, and then show that it's actually unethical and build it. That would be fun. Uh, we have Autonomous. Michael, shout out for Autonomous. This is amazing. It's one of the first autonomous artists. It creates art. It's an AI. Nobody owns and controls the AI. It sells it to the humans, and it gets money from the humans. And I choose how to spend it. Maybe you have our first AI autonomous billionaire in a, in a while. Let's see. It's just a fun experiment, but it shows a paradigm shift. Self-owned infrastructure. So you can think about self-driving cars and communicating with self-driving trucks. Maybe they pay to the self-owned road and be driven by self-owned wind farms and maybe in a self-owned grid. What's cool to think about is that if you create this autonomous layer and start thinking about, well, not 
all the resources belong to humans, maybe they just belong to themselves and need to protect themselves against humans, they can create something that we call Nature 2.0. And, and you can go to Nature 2.000, <laughs> uh, that's a website of uh, JP, and there nobody knows you're a forest. You're an intelligence living on this unstoppable substrate, and you're basically interacting with humans. For ocean, that means, in ocean protocol, nobody knows you're a data set. Nobody knows you're an AI. You have the ability to create self-steering, self-owned assets. And that's maybe something we can work off, or not, at least to explore. That's it. That's my talk. Wow. You took, us, um, you took us into the future, and uh, when we discussed this talk before, you said it wasn't even that long ago that the king of Belgium owned a whole country, and you're already oh, thinking. Yeah. I yeah. forgot that joke. Tell it. Yeah. It was funny. Uh, yeah, so uh, 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 about the privatization stuff. Um, well, in Belgium, we kind of had this moment in time uh, where, well, suddenly uh, one person got an entire country somewhere in Africa, and started manipulating it and extracting a lot of resources. And at some point in time, like, the entire community of, of, of other kings said, like, Leopold, you cannot do this. You have to give this back to the government. And he actually did, so let's keep that quiet about that silent <laughs> black, black Belgian history. <laughs> but that listen. wasn't even that long ago. Yeah, and it was 100 already, years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're already talking about autonomous systems. So how long do you think this is into the future? Well, it depends on you guys, okay. uh, because here it's interesting, like, if you can see what happened in, in Malta, where there is more legislation on creating sandboxes around making those self-owned agents an actual reality that can have legal impact, and I think here is kind of the right mix of people to, to make sure that these type of things maybe can have a control sandbox to explore. Could go quick. Well, 10 years maybe to, wow. to make it... Well, I think experimentation can go quick, but um, yeah, careful design is, and sandboxing and feedback systems and control and governance, you have to take that all into account. Yeah. So maybe we should send them to work. Thank you, yep. Dimitri, for your talk and for your inspiration. Thank you so much.